Yorgos Karevas, aged 52, was shot by contract killers near his home in Athens last week Friday. Yorgos Karevas was an investigative reporter researching organized crime and corruption. Before we start, I ask you for a moment of silence, a moment to commemorate him and send a sign of solidarity to his family, to his friends and to his colleagues. Thank you. The audience, journalists, politicians, activists, welcome to the Uncovered Conference organized by the European Center for Press and Media Freedom in cooperation with the International Press Institute in Vienna and the European Journalism Center. These three organizations run the IJ4U grant. Today's conference is one element of this project. It is financed by the European Commission and co-financed by Frit Ord, OSF, Luminate, and the city of Leipzig. My name is Lutz Kinkel. I'm ECPMF's Managing Director. IJ4U is a grant focusing on cross-border investigative journalism in the EU and candidate states. In this second project period of the grant, more than 1 million euro was handed in for investigations, more than 1 million euro. This grant and the journalists working with it create a truly European public sphere. They, the grantees, enable us, the citizens, to discuss what matters in Europe. This is how we can relate to Europe and the EU, and this is how we can understand the mutual dependence of these nations gathered in the EU. The agenda of this conference is threefold. Firstly, we are here to perceive and discuss the stories and scandals unearthed by the grantees. Secondly, we will confer the new Impact Award for outstanding investigative achievements in a ceremony this evening. Thirdly, we will reflect on the conditions of cross-border investigative journalism in Europe. After this welcome, we will start with the first panel and probably it's not surprising that the first panel deals straight with money means with funding. The host of this conference is former CNN moderator Ali Aslan. I will introduce him later. If you have any technical question, please don't hesitate to contact also our staff via chat. I'm now pleased to hand over for a short welcome by our IJ4U partners. Here's Catherine Gilles, Director Grants Program at the European Journalism Center and Barbara Trionfi, IPI's Executive Director. First of all, Catherine, welcome. The floor is yours. Okay, Catherine is obviously not uh, with us in the moment. Um, maybe I can turn to Barbara Trionfi, please, from IPI. Hi. Sorry. Thank you so much, um, Lutz. I hope you can hear me and see me. Um, yeah, so as you, as Lutz mentioned, we are coming to an end of a project period which has been extremely successful and, and one of the unique aspects of the IJ4 EU program um, is that not only it wasn't disrupted at all by the COVID-19 pandemic, but rather the opposite, that it gained in importance and relevance, specifically in these most difficult times for journalism. Um, in just its second year of uh, operation, the IJ4EU fund um, under IPI's leadership uh, in cooperation with our partners ECPMF and um, EJC has uh, succeeded in establishing itself as a highly credible and trusted 
trusted source of funding for cross-border investigative uh, journalism in Europe. And we are very proud to have uh, supported so many incredible investigations over the past year. Uh, investigations that have been tackling some of the most pressing topics uh, of the moment uh, and, and generating high quality uh, public debate uh, uh, with, with public debate with the power to affect really policies on the issues facing the European unions, unions and its um, citizens uh, these days. So man, many of these investigations will be highlighted over the course of, the, of this conference and I very much look forward to also uh, hearing more from the journalists about them. Uh, we are also very proud of the fact that the grant giving model that we have developed for IJ4EU allows journalists across Europe to pursue the kind of complex, time-consuming investigations that are harder than ever today, given the upheaval of the past year, uh, and yet uh, so important these days. Uh, the, the coronavirus pandemic, as mentioned, has not only created a new financial threat to independent uh, media, uh, but uh, you know the, the immense social, political, and uh, financial changes that we are seeing these days demand a journalism that more than ever is able to be the eyes and the ears of the public and exercise uh, its watchdog role. So we knew that it was essential to help provide the, resource, the resources for this type of journalism to be, um, to be possible. So I'm so glad that the IJ4EU was uh, really able to meet the moment in, in achieving this. But more broadly, if you want, the, the, the funding model of the IJ4EU contributes to the sustainability of the independent media by channeling public and philanthropic money into high quality watchdog journalism without compromising the editorial independence. And, and, and this, late, this aspect has been key to the success of the IJ4EU uh, fund and very much appreciated by our grantees. Um, as Luke said, IPI has overseen a program that awarded almost 1.1 million in France in 2020 and allowing over 260 journalists uh, from every EU member state and candidate country to pursue cross-border uh, cross journalistic projects in the public interest. In total, uh, we have uh, funded or contributed to fund 49 projects. Um, and that is out of the several hundreds of uh, teams that have applied for funds, which shows the immense need that there is for this type of work. Um, many of the IJ4EU investigations have already achieved also great public resonance and have been published in some of Europe's leading media, as well as uh, smaller independent uh, media in, in, in every country of the European Union, which underscores really our commitment to supporting the free and pluralistic media environment in Europe. Um, and we are also very proud that the, the, of the comprehensive support that the program um, uh, has been able to give to the grantees. Uh, and as a consortium, IPI, EJC, and ECPMF, uh, we have been able to offer editorial support, training, and legal support throughout the investigation and publication period, which has been also key to the success of these, of these projects. So, um, I'm uh, pasting, I'll, I'll be pasting soon a link to, in the chat box to the page of the project. And I really encourage you to have a look at some of the st stories that have been published under this project, that, which, which are really impressive. And you'll see the, 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 the unique value of cross-border journalism in this context. Uh, finally, I would like to join Lutz in thanking the donors that have made these achievements possible and, and that also trusted our model. Um, a special thank also goes to the, 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 the jury member, all the, all the jury members of the investigation support scheme in particular, which was led by the Süddeutsche Zeitung editor-in-chief Wolfgang Kach, which have done an admirable and very difficult work in selecting uh, the projects. But most of all, I really would like to congratulate the journalistic teams for their work. The, the, the range and depth of the stories published is spectacular, and it underscores the 
what really investigative journalism is all about and what it can achieve. But we, I'm certainly looking forward um, today and tomorrow to uh, you know, delve deeper into uh, why investigative journalism is a public good and, and why it must be supported uh, in sharing the best practices and learning more about the work done by, in, in the course of the last year by the IJ for EU uh, grantees. Uh, and once again, I would like to uh, thank ECPMF for organizing this important conference. Thank you. Back thank to you, Lutz. Thank you very much, uh, Barbara. Um, Catherine is still not with us. Uh, I don't know, maybe she has a technical problem. This is why it was possible for you to speak a little bit longer and give a comprehensive oversight of what the IJ4EU is all about. Thank you very much again, uh, Barbara. Um, maybe we can come back to Catherine later if she's there. Um, for now, I will turn now to the first panel. Uh, as I said, uh, it deals, and this is not surprising, with funding and money. Um, it's about funding cross-border investigative journalism. As you know, as you all know, the conditions for journalistic investigations in Europe, and Barbara already mentioned that, uh, are worsening year by year. One factor is the general decline of press and media freedom caused by authoritarianism and accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic is misused uh, by some governments uh, to further restrict access to information and also to criminalize the journalistic uh, research. The other factor is uh, the ongoing economic weakness uh, of the sector that is also accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic. The drop in advertising uh, revenues in the year 2020 is dramatic. And there are governments like in Poland and in Hungary that weaponize this situation to financially try out the last remaining critical media outlets. Um, investigative journalism itself is the supreme uh, discipline of journalism. Uh, it delivers new insights, it delivers new ways of thinking, uh, it holds the powerful to account. However, sometimes and well, I spent, I spent 20 years in journalism. Uh, sometimes it takes years to get a story done. And sometimes it takes years to find out that the trace is cold. Um, investigative journalism is costly. Investigative journalism is painstaking and it is time consuming. Uh, this is why publishing houses tend to reduce their investigative departments. And this is why we need to talk about funding. If we want to keep this specific element among the checks and balances of our democracies alive. Welcome to our panel on funding cross-border journalism in Europe. First of all, I would like to speak to two speakers that I will introduce now. All in all, we have five speakers I would ask the first two speakers to turn on now their camera. I'm happy to welcome Sabine Verheyen, who is head of the Culture Committee in the European Parliament. Mrs. Verheyen belongs uh, to the European People's Party. She is German and was, before entering the European Parliament, mayor of the city of Aachen. Uh, so she knows very well the relationship also between uh, journalists and uh, politicians. Welcome, Sabine. Hello. The second speaker is Anna Herold, head of the unit of audiovisual media policy at the European Commission. Mrs. Herold is former member of the cabinet of former commissioner Günther Oettinger. Um, welcome, Anna. Hello. She can hear us. Wonderful. Um, Mrs. Verheyen, the first um, question goes directly to you. IG4U is a project that was born in the European Parliament. Um, I think it was back in 2014. Uh, one of the drivers behind it was Benedek Javor. He was a, back then he was a member of the Green Party. Um, and I think it was not by accident that he comes from Hungary, right? Um, what do you remember of these early days and the reasons to, to start this project? Um, we had uh, difficult situations in many of our European countries when it came to uh, investigative journalism. 
the question of media freedom was already raised and uh, uh, years later we had the situation also in Malta uh, when you take a look to the situation in Romania uh, when it comes to the situation for journalists in Slo uh, Slovenia, Slovakia and, and Czech Republic uh, the Visegrad, uh, uh, Hungary, like Hungary and Poland uh, we got more and more the situation that uh, especially investigative journalism was politically under threat, uh, but also uh, uh, the um, situation in the press, uh, in the media environment as such, got more and more difficult uh, for um, the uh, investigative uh, uh, units uh, uh, with, the, with, the, uh, um, with the media. Uh, because uh, uh, also the income, not just because of COVID-19, but also the income in general, uh, because of uh, digitization, uh, uh, less revenues coming out of uh, uh, this, uh, of selling of, of, of media or press products, printed products, that all uh, the, the whole switch we had and, and, and shift we had in the, in the media scene with digitization uh, uh, and uh, several other issues uh, made a very difficult situation, especially for investigative journalism. That was the reason why the parliament said very clear, we have to do something. Uh, there must be an initiative to support investigative journalism. And in 2017, in the end, the European parliament initiated the special fund uh, to be spent exclusively on cross-border investigative journalism and I think that is uh, where we have the first fruits now uh, with the project that were um, uh, that will be presented today and uh, also uh, this evening in the ceremony. Uh, so what what did we do? We wanted to fund the grant uh, the grant via the European Commissions uh, uh, through the European Centre of Press and Media Freedom, the ECPMF, uh, which is based in Leipzig. We already heard about that from the from Barbara as well as the Norwegian Frit Art Foundation, which provided an additional 25,000 euros. Uh, the grants were administered by the International Press Institute, the IPI, uh, which is based in Vienna, and the projects uh, operate fully independently uh, in, from, uh, from IPI and ECPMF uh, uh, and the European Commission and other uh, IG for EU partners because it is important that investigative journalism stays independent. It is not somehow linked uh, to institutions or uh, organizations. Um, uh, the fund currently uh, disperses a maximum of 450,000 euro uh, uh, in one founding round uh, per year. So the single grants are between 5,000 and 50,000 euros. And uh, IG for you covers seventy percent. Mrs. Verheyen, it's it's one million this year. This year it's this one year million. One mil. No, it, I, I just came up. In the first the round, it was four hundred fifty thousand. Exactly. So you ask uh, how it started, and so I wanted to come yeah. up with this. Uh, meanwhile, we have a lot uh, done, a lot more. There is much more money in the budget now, and what we also want to do is to to go forward with the program. Um, um, because uh, it is important in the situation we have uh, uh, at the moment uh, when it comes to investigative journalism that we do something from the public side. And it's not in that sense uh, that we just want to promote uh, those uh, uh, journalistic, uh, this journalistic work uh, that is pleasant for us as politicians or as governments, but we want to have this investigative this independent investigative journalism, because it's one of the columns of a functioning democracy. Uh, without this, we don't have the watchdog function anymore. If you just make copy and paste from uh, 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 messages you get from all over the world, but not have the uh, capacity, the financial and also the personal uh, capacity to have investigative journalism, uh, it will be to the, det uh, uh, to the detriment of uh, functioning dem democracies. And that is uh, why the uh, parliament is supporting this uh, very, very strongly with different actions, not just via these funds, via these projects, um, but also via other initiatives that will come up in the next months and years. Thank you so much. Uh, I saw Anna Herold nodding. Um, and this means uh, we are all practically on the same page when it comes to this program, right, Anna? Yes, indeed. Uh, we are extremely grateful.
for the European Parliament for initiating um, this particular um, funding project. Uh, and I think it's in a way a model uh, of how public funding can help independent media and independent journalism that I think uh, you and Barbara already, you know, quite eloquently described the situation in which uh, independent media and journalism uh, are, are finding themselves today. Um, and all the negative trends that we have seen in the past have been only exacerbated by the pandemic, as you have also all mentioned. So I think we are extremely proud of the fact that we have managed to put in place, um, uh, again, at the initiative of the parliament, uh, a project uh, where this full independence of the media is ensured. This has been already explained by Barbara. Uh, and this has been the uh, obviously the initial idea of the European Parliament to show that it is possible to fund media in uh, by still by by having this total uh, arm's length approach and not intervening in any way into the selection of the actual projects, the journalistic projects, these great examples of journalistic collaboration and this difficult field of investigative journalism uh, are. Um, and it, I think it is also an excellent example uh, of um, what the role of these pilot projects and preparatory actions and the important role of the parliament plays um, uh, in, 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 in helping the Commission to, uh, in policy conception, because this, this whole idea is indeed that we try out um, funding in new areas uh, that hopefully uh, then find way um, of more stable funding in programs, which is in a way happening as we speak, because uh, um, projects uh, like the one we are talking today about, uh, this editorial collaboration between media outlets and other uh, journalists and other partners in the news media sector will be part uh, of the funding uh, that we will set up in the uh, cross under the cross sectoral strand of the new program of Creative Europe um, uh, that uh, will start uh, soon. So I think that both from the way the project has been set up, but also in a way the impact it has on the policy conception and development where funding, independent fun, uh, funding of um, investigative journalism flows into the general policy of the, uh, of the EU um, shows uh, that I think we can uh, really be proud of, of what has been um, Anna, you already mentioned the multi-annual financial uh, framework, uh, 2021 to 2027, and uh, the Creative Europe program, the cross-sectoral strand. Um, this means, when I got you right, um, that you will um, continue funding investigative journalism under this, uh, under this umbrella uh, in the future. Is there also a poly uh, possibility that the means or the financial means will be even increased? in comparison? We will have, um, I think, quite a positive development and in a way stepping up efforts. Again, uh, on the one hand, thanks to the European Parliament, and on the other hand, thanks to this um, um, new possibilities under the cross-sectoral strand. Because as Mr. Hayen already mentioned, there will be new projects the European Parliament has asked us, for example, for the next, uh, for the following year to implement uh, new funding for investigative journalism, also in view of the kind of emergency needs that the sector is facing due to the pandemic. So just one example that I can quote. So we will continue um, funding certain pilot projects and preparatory actions at the request of the European Parliament. And at the same time, we will, um, believing this transition period of the new program that indeed uh, under this strand will um, foresee calls 
for collaborative news partnerships where editorial collaboration could also be part of this project. So, so, so there will be, let's say, more opportunities uh, um, even if we compare uh, the situation to the, let's say, to the previous years, no, that have, uh, that, that anyway prepared the grant for this, uh, for this development. Thank Perhaps you for giving this just perspective, yeah, this Ms. Verheyen. Um, uh, you know that we increased the budget for the whole uh, Creative Europe program and also for the media program. So the expectation from Parliament side is that the Commission will spend more money in the end also for these things, uh, because there is nearly a doubling of the budget compared to the old program. Uh, so um, uh, in total, there are also new uh, ideas what to support and how to come forward. But I think especially to support investigative journalism is one of the core tasks we should uh, uh, concentrate also on uh, uh, to build up and set up a public sphere um, uh, uh, on the European level uh, where member states uh, uh, start to fail more and more. Um, you know that we all also made uh, a special committee on disinformation. And I think also there we have uh, the special role of investigative journalism to find out what's really uh, uh, the case in some uh, some points because propaganda disinformation plays a more and more uh, 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 important role in our everyday life and so we have to set something against and that is also a good functioning and well uh, financed investigative journalism that the reason why we expect as parliament that the commission will spend more and give more opportunities like they said but also out of the recovery fund. Uh, we were very sad about uh, that the member states um, did not allow uh, uh, the commission and the parliaments to make stricter rules for implementing uh, the 700 billion because uh, we uh, would like to see the member states to invest also money out of these programs uh, for implemented and spent in the right way, uh, in the way uh, um, not just the member states would like to see it, but especially when it comes to media, to keep an eye that this money reaches really the independent media sphere uh, in the member states and not just uh, the media that uh, is, uh, uh, let's say, um, accepted and liked by the, by the government. Uh, uh, I think that's not the aim. Uh, we want to uh, uh, to reach with the with the funding, and that's the reason why we uh, will take a, a very careful look on the implementation. We will make also implementation reports on this, uh, really to take a look: is the is the money uh, 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 used for the right things, or is there something where we have to uh, call back and uh, uh, have to 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 bring situations uh, to the discussions in the parliament again? or uh, even have the possibility to stop the payments uh, when the money is not spent correctly. We have now, um, with the new instruments, the possibility uh, with the um, uh, rule of law uh, mechanism, and I hope that uh, we will really use it 
uh, when uh, the situation is there. Anna, would you like to add something here? Uh, well, uh, Mr. Hain has already, uh, I think, um, been uh, extremely clear about it. Uh, there is uh, a great degree of control, and of course, uh, first the, the member states have to submit to our to us to the Commission their plans. We are extremely vigilant and um, and 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 uh, um, uh, and agree also on a performance framework with the member states, uh, but. And there, there, there surely will be possibilities and say, you know, and, uh, for safeguards uh, for a possible misuse. But if I may, uh, the concern that we are having now is actually not so much um, um, the, 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 this, because there is so far very little at all from the member states on the support for the culture and creative sectors in the recovery plans. So we are extremely keen on, on seeing more on this in general. Eh? So I think that this is also another aspect that we should not forget in this, in this discussion, because while we know that we have the 20% um, um, target for digital, and Ms. Verheyen uh, has already expressed her um, views on the fact that we don't have anything specific for cultural sectors, no, uh, mm. as such, unfortunately, uh, um, still within the 20%, we would be very happy to see support to the, to the media. Uh, however, this is not necessarily what we are seeing. So I think that these two aspects have to be balanced out. And uh, also we have to be frank with each other. Uh, it is not through the implementation of the of these recovery plans that we will be able to counter the developments that you have been mentioning, Lutz. So, of course, the Commission is considering uh, what it could do more in this area to safeguard independence and, and media freedom in all the member states. Thank you very much. Um, now the time is already running out. Uh, I would have liked to discuss um, the media action plan that the Commission also set up. Uh, I can only tell you, the audience, uh, to look it up. Uh, there is comprehensive material also in the web that would show you all the aspects of the media action plan. There are a lot of interesting aspects in it. For example, that there will be a new software that it will make more easy to find uh, funding, EU funding, and also to apply for EU funding. This is something that hopefully everybody can use uh, also to uh, get a better access. Um, and also, I want to recommend to you uh, the News Media Forum. Uh, the first News Media Forum conference already took place now in spring. It was uh, dedicated to the protection of journalists. Uh, the second news me media forum will take place in autumn and it will be dedicated to uh, funding and to financing and to the media industry. Also extremely uh, interesting and valuable. Thank you very much for the moment, uh, um, Anna Herold and Sabine Verheyen. I would like to ask now um, uh, the private uh, donors and funders to enter the stage. Um, this is the second round of the talk. Um, each speaker stands for an organization that is already connected with investigative journalism because they support the IJ for EU grant. Please welcome with me Kitty von Bertele, Principal at Luminate and managing the organization's grants in Western Europe. Um, welcome with me Audrey Jurek, Jurek Program Specialist for uh, Investigative Journalism at Open Society Foundations and an adventurer. Um, you may have a look at his videos um, where he's uh, describing his trips through also through Latin America, which are very amazing. And um, last not least, Knut Olaf Amas, the director of Frit Ord. The foundation is based in Oslo, Norway. I hope we, please, if you turn on all your cameras, um, Kitty, Audrey, and Knut, and then we can start. I see now Kitty von Bertele. Welcome. And I would start directly with you, Kitty. Um, um, 
you are represented you are representing luminate here um i went a little bit through the lists of organizations that luminate is already supporting uh, we see a lot of well-known organizations among them like cpj mldi reporters without borders a european journalism center you also support uh, outlets uh, that produce uh, let's say public interest uh, media um, and investigative journalism among them uh, the bureau of investigative journalism and also the german corrective um, which is located in berlin um, would you also accept um, single persons as grantees or group of freelancers that follow and pursue a certain project or do you only and exclusively work together with already established organizations Thank you, Lutz, and for the question um, and the previous speakers. I found it really interesting to hear about and think about how this program kicked off. Um, and I'm also taking away a resolution to figure out how to be introduced as an adventurer at the beginning of a panel session. Um, <laughs> maybe in answer to your question, it's helpful to, I don't know how much the um, audience here will know about Luminate. So just as a brief introduction, we're the one of the philanthropic organizations set up by Pierre Omidyar, who um, founded eBay. So it's his money that we um, spend on a range of different areas in about 18 or 19 countries around the world. And independent media is a big area of focus for us. As Lutz has said, um, we have a large portfolio of grantees in that area. And the question about whether we support outlets or uh, freelance journalists, independent journalists is, I mean, it's a tricky one because there's no hard and fast rule to it. But given the, the sort of position we play and the objectives we have for a strong, thriving market for investigative journalism, for good media, sort of journalism as a public good, and we're also really interested in in models to make sure that is sustainable, right? to make sure that it can continue to thrive. We have tended to focus our funding, therefore, on institutions that, that surround that because we want there to be strong and functioning institutions. We believe a lot in giving core support and core funding to journalism organizations who are undertaking investigations. I fully appreciate that journalism organizations rely heavily on individuals and freelancers. So one thing is like, we would always, always want to make sure that any organization we're funding pays freelancers properly and has the space and scope to do that. And as you said, we give support to bodies that offer protections or legal support or some of that sort of infrastructure to, to freelance journalists and individuals as well. I think for us, it's difficult to think about funding people specifically because well, there's various reasons one it's it's hard to do and hard to think about how to how to balance that and um and we you know we have a, a generous budget but our, our funding is not limitless and so there's a there's a sort of a call that needs to be made at some stage about what the most effective funding mechanisms are to make sure independent journalism, investigative journalism can, can thrive. And also we don't want to fund specific investigations. We don't want to have sort of editor, any editorial engagement. We want to make sure that the organizations we fund are able to pursue stories totally independently of, um, which is why we focus really heavily on giving core support and building the sort of capacity and infrastructure for those investigations to happen. And I can't quite think through how a funder like us would fund individual journalists without getting a bit more involved in the specific direction of investigations. So I'm really interested in getting more money into the sector. I think as a funder, we take our role as a fundraiser also very seriously, building sort of uh, more capacity, um, working with funders who don't currently fund journalism to bring them in. I do a lot of work um, on the environment for public benefit journalism for investigative journalism and trying to think about what the regulatory environment is that could um, enable more funders to come into this space because it's it's poorly funded. That's why the European Commission support is, is a really interesting sort of model to think about. Um, 
And a colleague of mine at Luminate is also working on an international fund for public interest media, which is a huge push to raise more money from across the world to support journalism. So there are, there are different mechanisms by which we think about how to get money to the kind of journalism and the kind of journalists you're talking about. But it's probably a bit far off for us to be able to fund individuals. Uh, Luminate um, concentrates, as you said, well, on organizations and institutions. Um, and they say, um, what we can also read on your homepage, don't call us, call, we call you. This is now my wording. Uh, you say, and uh, when I put it in your words, we do not currently accept unsolicited applications. Uh, what does that mean in practice? Um, how can people get in touch with you and probably pitch for their projects? How is that possible? Yeah, it's a, it's a good point to raise and you know, it is, there is, as far as I have seen it, no perfect model for how a funder can be open and, um, and sort of invite the widest possible uh, ideas and exposure and also within the capacity we have manage the kind of floods of applications you would get. So uh, the way it works in practice is we do a lot, a lot of sort of scanning of the landscape of what is what is out there, what exists. Once we've started funding organizations, that obviously broadens our network and we get to see more work and more things that are happening. So it's um, it's quite organic, which is quite an unsatisfactory answer to give, I guess. Um, the one advantage is that we don't have a sort of um, we don't have funding round and application processes, so we can fund quite nimbly. We can fund on a rolling basis throughout the year. But it's, um, yeah, it's not, I appreciate it's not that uh, transparent how to get in touch with us. I mean, I would be really happy to share my email address for people to, to reach out to. I can put Excellent. that in the chat box. I will, I will do that in the spirit of transparency. I will also, in the spirit of that transparency, say we don't have limitless capacity. And, and to the point I was saying in the answer to your first question, there are, you know, there are ways in which we fund and, and models that we look for and prefer. But if I give my email address, I'm happy for people to be in touch and I can let you know really quickly whether the work you're doing is within within scope or interest. I'm very happy to give give quick, fast feedback on whether something is um, within our strategy or not. Thank you, Kitty. That that is really very kind of you. And uh, we are happy to to post your email address also in the chat. And um, yeah, thank you for your remarks on that. I have to apologize that I didn't introduce you as an adventurer. I know that you've worked for in several positions for uh, governments also. I guess this was adventurous, but uh, I didn't find anything that you talked about that, this experience. <laughs> and um, yeah, if you want to make a documentary about your background experience at the governments, I think. Uh, this could also be an adventure. So thank you for that. Now we come to Audrey. Uh, Audrey represents the Open Society Foundation. Uh, like Luminate, um, you're also in contact with a lot of um, uh, lot of well-known organizations. Uh, you are currently restructuring the complete program of uh, OSF. Um, with regard to the COVID-19 pandemic. What does that mean uh, for funding um, um, and to support uh, support uh, journalism and media freedom? Will the budgets grow because the sector is so heavily affected? Uh, or do you have different priorities now and for the next years? Yeah, then, uh, thanks Lux, for, uh, for, for inviting me. And I think, you know, supporting investigative journalism is adventure in itself for for sure. So in terms of our of our restructuring, it's not just because of, of, of COVID-19. So the OSF is going right now for people that are not aware of it through one of the biggest um, transformation in, you know, in a, in a decade or, or perhaps two decades. So it's, you know, as the world around us has changed, also the foundation wants to um, adjust to this to this new reality. So the change is much more profound at OSF uh, than just because of COVID. COVID, cer COVID certainly is one of the factors. Um, and as we are going through this transformation, um, you know, we're not completely at the end of it. So we don't know exactly how it's going to look uh, at the end. Of course, we in in the uh, in the journalism program believe that. Uh, 
investigative journalism will remain the strong part, even in the transformed OSF, but we're still going through it. Um, uh, regardless, uh, the, the transformation is coming not because there is any sort of, uh, you know, financial constraints on, on, on us. So in any case, uh, you know, uh, and any, as in any transformation, there's going to be, you know, people that we're going to continue with and people that we perhaps will, will not. Uh, but because the problems or, or the change is not coming from not having enough funds, we will, you know, we will certainly have enough pile of funds uh, and be able to uh, to kind of end the relationship in a kind of responsible way and have the conversations with people that we need to have at, um, at, at the moment. And as I said, we hope that investigative journalism uh, has shown, you know, how important it is and continues to be important for for all the work that OSF really does, a lot of the, the successes that civil society had over the over the past decade has been based on on the investigation. So we believe um, we should come at the end of this with the strong support of the investigative journalism. But we'll have to wait for the outcome of uh, of this transformation. Okay, we are very interested and keen on this information. Uh, it's highly important um, also for this audience that we have here at the uh, conference. Um, OSF has also a program for individuals and um, you have a lot of scholarships and fellowships. Is there something around these scholarships and fellowships that you would specifically recommend to investigative journalists? Uh, yeah, so OSF does have a fellowship and scholarship programs, but typically they're typically not focused on, on, on developed countries or the countries that are or, or individuals that are within European European Union. I think one of the things that I that I would that I would recommend, and, and it, you know that OSF has been supporting for the, for the past past decade, um, uh, is uh, you know uh, applying to funding to uh, organization like Journalism Fund. I mean, we've been supporting them. They've really been pioneers in in, in supporting uh, this sort of work for 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 over a decade, and we've been there. With them from the beginning, so I think that's one of the sources. And similarly to um, to Illuminate, we don't support individual investigative journalists, but through something like Journalism Fund, there is an opportunity to to uh, to, to apply for the for for the funds through 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 them. And thank you. And, and of course, we also have a global you know global grantees such as GIG and they do not provide uh, financial support to journalists but there is a lot for in, a lot of resources for investigative journalism and you know if you go to GIGN.org uh, website that they that they have and they're one of our grantees as well and we believe the resources are are very valuable although they do not provide uh, financial resources yeah you're talking about capacity building and uh, trainings and all that um, thank you very much. Um, last not least, I come to Knut Olaf Amas, uh, the director of Fried Ord. Um, Fried Ord is based in Oslo, um, and I also went through the list of beneficiaries. I saw that you support also a lot of, you have a lot of small grants as well uh, that are dedicated then to journalism and to professional journalism, to article series and so on. Uh, and a lot of these small grants go to a journalist in Norway or in Scandinavia. How important is the focus on Scandinavia for your work uh, as a foundation? Well, uh, the Fritwood Foundation is not, not a very big uh, foundation and our main obligation and program ha has always been uh, from the start uh, in uh, Norway. Uh, but uh, through, throughout all this period, and especially the last 10 or 15 years, we have uh, spent a considerable part of our budgets uh, uh, internationally, and especially in the US and, uh, and in Europe, uh, in particular Central Europe, Eastern Europe, uh, when it comes to journalism and uh, free media. Um, we, um, uh, we we support lots of investigative and uh, critical projects, uh, mostly connected to outlets and organizations. In uh, Norway, uh, freelancers 
both individuals and groups are some of our most, most important grantees. But uh, globally in Europe, we, we tend to, to give priority to, to outlets and organizations, but uh, we are willing to discuss uh, group projects uh, on an independent level, um, provided that they, um, they have good uh, prospects of uh, being published in good places. Um, uh, some of some of the specific cross-border projects we uh, we are funding uh, has been uh, with us for uh, for some years. In fact, I, I think we were one of the first funders of European cross-border investigative journalism from 2009 on, and then through providing the journalism fund .eu with uh, seed funding. And, and uh, that project was unique for its time. And the journalism fund.eu is still with us. Uh, one of our biggest receivers is the uh, Investigate Europe, a uh, small network, high quality, lots of good stories in uh, six or seven different countries. I would uh, <clears throat> recommend you other founders to have a look at Investigate Europe, really high quality work. And we are also a founder or a co-founder of the International Consortium of Investigative Journalism, journalists, of course, and the International Press Institute through our present program, I, IJ for you. And, um, and then we have two uh, cross-border programs also where we are partners and not, uh, not only giver of grants. That is the, uh, the Perspective program in Russia, together with the Thomson Reuters Foundation, and, uh, and also the, uh, the um, broader foundation program um, with a focus on Central Europe uh, called uh, Civitatis. So uh, that's, uh, that's some of our projects today, and, and uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Knut. Uh, I mean, um, we are already running out of time, unfortunately. But um, yes. just one thing I would like to mention: uh, Frit Ort uh, says uh, that they receive, in the average, three thousand applications each year. And Frit Ort is not such a really huge, big organization. And um, um, you already mentioned uh, that you received last year 5,200 applications, so 40% more. This could also mm. be regarded as an outcry, uh, from my perspective, mm. of the media sector. Uh, this is also a sign how badly uh, the money is needed and the funding is needed, and how much uh, pressure uh, the sector in the moment has to bear. And so, thank you very much. I was very pleased and honored to moderate this panel and to have the European Commission, the European Parliament, and also you as representatives of the private donors uh, with us. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we applaud your work and uh, we hope you will continue in the next years. Thank you. I will now hand over to our host um, that will host these two days of the Uncovered Conference. This is Ali Aslan. He's an international TV presenter and a journalist, uh, former staffer of CNN and Deutsche Welle and ABC News in New York. He will take over now from here. I have to say thank you very much. We see us later at the ceremony uh, for the Impact Award. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you, Lutz, uh, for this first panel and this very kind introduction. Indeed, it's my great pleasure to be part of this very important and timely conference uh, that will take place virtually here in uh, Leipzig. I think I speak for all when I say the conference is off to a very lively, very informative uh, start with the first uh, panel. But there's much, much more to come, obviously, today and uh, tomorrow as well. As a matter of fact, there are up to three things going on at the same time, three uh, channels which are streaming simultaneously. Many, many options for you to choose from. In order to check out the conference agenda and be up uh, to date, uh, do go to uh, the conference website regularly. It's uncovered.ij4.eu. You will find the whole main conference agenda there. 
Um, there's going to be a quick 15-minute break on the main agenda, meaning here on Channel 1, but Channel 2 and Channel 3 are operating. Let me tell you what's going on there. On Channel 2 at 3.15, you can find the Cross-Border Chronicles panel on investigating the pandemic. That'll start at 3.15. On Channel 3, you can find the documentary. You can watch the documentary, Daphne, a pen to sharp that'll take place on channel three. Let me just point out uh, uh, one particular note concerning channel three. You must register for the conference to receive an access code for channel three. That has to do with copyright uh, reason. I'm sure something you well understand. So as I said, three channels going on mainly at the same time. Do check out the conference agenda. Also, let me point out uh, and introduce the conferencing software that is provided by Big Blue Button. Uh, you can't turn on your mic, but you can participate in the chat. So a lot of information that I've provided you with. Don't worry if you haven't gotten and absorbed it all. I will come back throughout the conference and keep you up uh, to date. Uh, needless to say, we're off to a great start. There's going to be a 15-minute break now, but uh, we'll be back uh, with a very, very important panel that will take us behind the scenes of the FinCEN files and will highlight the power of networks to enable cross-border journalism. That'll take place sharp at 3 p.m. here. For now, I'm Ali Aslan. Great to be part of this conference and uh, see you back soon. Don't stray away too, too far.